as requested by Michelle and hope that we can iron out any audio issues. You should be able to hear me. If you can hear me and we can get started, just let me know in the chat and we'll get rocking and rolling. All right, I'm gonna take a stab at this because I think we we need to start get rolling. Can you hear me? Can you see me? If so, please let me know in the chat because I do have the chat up and that will be a, a way for me to guarantee that things are in fact coming across. I'm listening to my iPad, which is in this session as well. And that appears to be working okay. Why? And it's recording. I should not be muted. So I, yes, we can hear you. All right, great. Well, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Sorry for the inevitable Zoom delays or the Zoom problems with technology. But that said, let's get this party started. And this party starts out by me sharing this keynote with you. And it's called What's Social Media Good For and Why It's Good For You? A lot of people are asking that question, especially under or overstressed, under resourced marketing managers for all sorts of companies. And for a lot of those people, social media is just an extra thing on their plate that may not have a tremendous amount of perceived value. Well, I'm here to tell you that's a mistake. And I want to prove that to you in this presentation. First of all, let's just get on the same page about what branding is and what it is not. Well, in, in this case, when I say brand, what do I mean? Well, Brand for some people is nothing more than consistent use of graphic standards, things like logo, color, and typography. Sometimes there's a theme and then there could be a tagline associated with those graphic standards and that's brand, right? Well, yeah, it's part of a brand, but I think it's uh, something a little bit bigger than just a campaign. It's, it's more than graphic standards. It's actually something more akin to this. It's everything from the way you answer your phones to your CEO's public behavior, because that CEO can crater your brand overnight, just like back in the day, Travis Kalanick did of Uber. Now, that's, that's just an old example, but we can point to countless examples of C-level executives cratering a brand very, very quickly because they truly are representative of the brand but not necessarily always prepared to be the brand walking, breathing out there in public. For me, I believe in a form of branding I call nonfiction branding, which is all about understanding that a brand isn't something you apply like a sticker or tie on like a pair of shoes. It's more like exactly who you are deep down in the core of your DNA your DNA as a person, your DNA as a company, your DNA as a collection of individuals who actually make up the company. So when I talk about branding, that's where I'm coming from. And the question is, why is branding so important? Well, that's why. In a sea of commodity gummy bears, the one red gummy bear stands out like a beautiful sore thumb. And that's the goal of any branding activity whatsoever. It's to differentiate you from your peers. Now, again, what's the number one goal of branding? Single word, differentiation. And that goes all the way back to the origin of branding. I'm talking about this kind of branding. Why did they do this? Well, because your white cow looks like my white cow. How are we supposed to tell who's who's and what's what's and all that stuff? Well, the answer is, I brand them. I literally physically put my brand on that cow. Now, even then, that cow is still a commodity cow. But if my brand is known for treating the animals better, for giving them better food and forage by um, 
bringing them to market more carefully, I can have a premium brand of cow. Need proof of that? Go look at the price of Kobe beef or Kobe steaks versus any other steak or Omaha steaks. Same thing. Steak is a commodity unless it's a Kobe steak, unless it's an Omaha steak. The number one technique of branding, going back to the very beginning, is demonstration, showing who you are, what you do, and how you do it. And the thing is that a lot of people in academia know this basic saying. In academia, you either publish or perish. And what that means is that universities want people, professors, researchers, scientists, leaders who are brands because the, that brand burnishes the entire university's brand. And if you don't have a brand, you aren't adding anything of value to the institution of learning. Well, here's the thing. We all want to be brands, not commodities. And there's a cool way to do that because right now you are your own publisher. You don't have to wait to be published by someone else. You can do it yourself via the incredible power tools of social media, which are your printing press. It used to be said that the power of the press, the power of the press exists with those who own the press. Well, guess who owns the press? You do. And for the first time in human history, you can access an entire globe that is online waiting to hear about who you are, what you do, how you do it, how you're different, and why they should engage with you. And I wanna introduce you to some of the press, but not only that, it's the free press. Because again, all of these logos represent major channels that I'm sure you're all familiar with on social media. And this is but a small subset of all those out there, but all of them, have a free level of uh, account that's available to you. And it gives you 80 to 90% of what those channels are can be used for, for the price of nothing, zero. So for the first time in history, I can upload a video that can be viewed in Japan, Indonesia, Germany, France, Argentina, you name it. If I put it on YouTube, anybody with access to YouTube can possibly meet me understand who I am, what I do and how I do it and receive my message. Now, as you look at that kind of tiering of social media channels, you can see that the top tier literally is what I consider to be the top tier of channels. LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. And then right behind it is TikTok because that's the flavor of the day right now. But the bottom line is you can't necessarily do all of these things. And you shouldn't necessarily do all these things. But if you aren't doing any of these things, you are leaving opportunity on the table for someone else. And believe me, they're taking advantage of it. And that brings us to Rotoma. Now, Rotoma is not all, only the name of a book that I co-wrote with Spencer X. Smith. It's a concept that is really important to understand when it comes to what is the true value of social media. What does Rotoma stands for? It stands for return on top of mind awareness. Rotoma, return on top of mind awareness. There will be a test, so you better know what Rotoma stands for. I'm kidding. The number one rule of social, show, don't tell. I can tell you all day long that I'm a female Romanian gymnast but I certainly could not demonstrate that I am. So I can, what I tell you is nowhere near as important as what I show you. And the best way to show it is by doing something like this, showing your big story small. Now this, I'm, I'm, I know you guys are involved with uh, remodeling primarily, and this is focusing more on the design and build aspects of things, but you can see things that apply directly to you, specifically this next slide, which is all about BTS for the win. Now, when I say BTS, I'm not talking about these guys, the Korean pop group. I'm talking about behind the scenes. I just wanna make sure, yep, 
we're doing okay. Behind the scenes, what does that mean? In this case, let's share your 57 story story. This makes for compelling video. And if you need to know whether it works or not, just type in BTS on LinkedIn and ignore the stuff that's about the Korean uh, pop group and look at the number of videos and the number of views associated with the behind the scenes videos. If you're an architecture company or a builder, this is the best way to demonstrate who you are, what you do and how you do it. How about this one? I love this one because it's for a named company and it shows very quickly what it took to build that, uh, that franchise, that store for Krispy Kreme. Now, if you did this for your customers and then they saw this, what's their first question going to be? Can we have a copy of this for our website? Can we use this on our social media channels? Can we use your name in association with this to say how proud we were to work with you? Having this physical asset is incredibly powerful because you can use it all over the place. And guess who's ingratiated to you for you doing this? The people who actually hired you. What a, what a fantastic way to market not only yourselves, but your customers, because, and here's one of the killer tips on social media. If you want to look good on social, make other people look great. This video right here makes Krispy Kreme look great. And anytime you shine the spotlight on somebody else, guess what happens? It reflects back on you. Here's another one that I really love. And again, this is like the other ones you've seen. Oh, take a look at this. Yeah, you got the human ants all over the place building this thing. But this is so much more than just a time-lapse video. This is a video brochure. Think about it this way. All that stuff that you see on the right column, all that detail, all that information, all that marketing messaging is happening in a video that works like this. The first time you watch nothing but the, the store, the, the whole building going up. The second time you watch it, you capture some of the information that you're sharing in the marketing messages. And the third time you show it is when you walk into the decision maker, the, the founder, the CEO, the uh, whoever's in charge of green lighting stuff, and you show them this video and say, we want to work with these guys because they're demonstrating very clearly and compellingly who they are, what they do, and how they do it in a way that makes it so darn easy for you to get the sale sold um, from the decision maker. This is a video brochure. Remember the back in the days when you had to have a beautiful glossy brochure to make a sale? This is the modern version of a beautiful glossy brochure. And boy, is it compelling. And boy, is it shareable. So the question is, do people actually watch these things? Well, let's take a look at this one, the official 11-year time-lapse video of building One World Trade Center in New York. Do you see that down there? How many views? 17,490,000 and change. The first time I did a screenshot of this video for, the, for a presentation, it was down at 12 million. It is now at 17 million, 17, almost 17 and a half million. And it keeps climbing. Once this is up on YouTube, it is an evergreen, always on silent salesman or active salesman for your company, because you are showing people what they want to see, which is, I wonder, I wonder how this works, how, how they can, I want to see it from a hole in the ground to magnificent building. It works for you 24 seven, everywhere around the world. There's another technique I want to share with you. The previous one was about behind the scenes. This is before and after anyone who's ever watched a makeover show on a cable channel knows the power of this. You take something schlubby and you make it gorgeous. Well, take a look at this. You got the before, you got the after. You got the before and after. Same thing here. If you want to show 
how good a room can look, show them how challenged it was before and how it looked after. In fact, this is such a popular genre that there is a channel or a, an account on Instagram called before after dot design that does nothing but share before and after images. And does it work? Yeah, they've got 1.2 million followers. And in fact, your company could engage with these guys and get on their feed potentially. The whole point is, are you putting up before after photos on your social media feeds? If not, why not? Because people love this stuff. Now, what is the real benefit of all this social media stuff? I'm alive. I'm alive. I'm still here. I'm still here. Every time you post something on social media, you get that return on top of mind awareness. And that top of mind awareness is incredibly important. When is it the most important? Let's take a look at this. This is your customer. You know, every customer has a cycle, right? They're not in the market at all. Being top of mind then, not a bad idea at all. Because eventually they're going to be in the point of uh, needing a request for proposal or an RFQ for a new uh, project they want to do. Being top of mind there, is that valuable? Absolutely. And then once they get to the purchase stage and the preference stage, are you pinging top of mind? Yeah, very valuable there. And then afterwards, they've made a purchase, they're happy with it, and they're talking to friends who are like, hey, who did this? Or do you know anyone who does what you do? They become active referral sources because you're top of mind with them. So again, there is no time where top of mind isn't important. In fact, it's always the right time to be top of mind. And never, ever forget the heart is greater than the head because the head merely rationalizes what the heart already wants. And that applies especially to people in the design community because I can't tell you why I paid uh, $1,500 for a leather chair that will last so long that my daughters will fight over it when I die. But it's certainly not because I wanted to spend that money. It's because I wanted to have something to leave to my daughters that they would fight over. Just saying. Now, here's a technique that I really love for people to understand, and that is to treat every communication like it's a date. Now, the question is, is it a first date, a second date, a third date, or a 53rd date? What do I mean by that? First dates are not about anything other than getting a second date. If you give out too much information in that first date, you're not getting a second date. All you want to do is give out enough information to make them go, huh, yeah, this was fun. You're nice person. I'd love to get to know more about you. So treat every marketing communication as if it's a date and market like a baseball card. Now, this is Ernie Banks from the Chicago Cubs back in the day. What do you know about this guy? He's got a nice smile. He plays first base and his name is Ernie Banks and he plays for the Cubs. That's all the information you need. That's enough right there to get me interested. Tell me more, Ernie. Well, here's another example of a first date. Here's Milwaukee Brewer, Christian Yelich. Now, this is showing a nice young guy, seems nice, plays for the Brewers, plays outfield, cool. That's enough information to get a second date. But the second that you mark it like a baseball card and flip it over, you got all the information mama needs when you take him home to meet mama. How tall is he? How much does he weigh? What's his RBIs? How many home runs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All that detailed information comes after the first date. Most of social is about first and second dates. It's designed to get you interested to seek out more information. You know, it's like if you see on Instagram a pair of shoes that you like, you may not have been in the market to buy that pair of shoes, but you see them 
There's a very simple one click and it'll take you to the place where you can purchase, where you can get information on sizing, different colors, et cetera, et cetera. They didn't show you all the different colors. They didn't show you all the different sizes. They just showed you enough information to get you interested from that first date into having a second date or for you to drive down even further into the buying process or dare I say funnel, whatever your marketing funnel is toward engagement. Now, the, the thing about that Christian Yelich uh, baseball card I wanted to point out to you is that, man, this is terrible brand storytelling. Why? Because while Christian Yelich may be an outfielder, his brand story is all about his bat, his home run hitting. You know, again, he's an outfielder in this card, and yet he got on the national radar of anyone who likes Major League Baseball because of his home run hitting ability. Reminds me of this guy. Who's this guy? We all know who this guy is. Even people who don't give a wit about baseball know that this is Babe Ruth, and they may not even know that he played for the New York Yankees, but they know that's Babe Ruth. What do you know about him? Home run hitter. Exactly. What position did he play? Now, if you're a baseball fan, you might know that he was actually a pitcher for a period of time and evidently good enough to be a Hall of Fame pitcher. But as soon as he started showing his ability with a bat, they didn't want to put him in a position where he could damage. You know, pitcher is a high breakdown position on a team. They didn't want their home run hitter to be damaged or injured. So they moved him to the outfield. So here's the thing. The what you do playing the outfield may not be the actual true story of who you actually are. So that's why it's so important to really understand who you are at a core level, what I call a nonfiction brand level. And, you know, because here's the thing, if you don't own it, it's not yours. But the only thing that is truly 100% yours is you and your brand. And if you're working for an organization, that brand is made up of the personal brands of everybody within that organization. And the question is, are you all working and singing from the same song sheet, if you will, when it comes to your personal brands working for your company brand? That is so important. Why? A completely true, completely you brand helps inoculate you from what I like to call the broad brush syndrome. Now, what is a broad brush syndrome? Well, let me give it, you an example using law firms because law firms are easy to pick on because if you take a look at any list of the most or least trusted professions, guess where lawyers end up? They're just above car salesmen and members of Congress but they're nowhere near the top. Lawyers, in spite of their incredibly high educational attainment and undoubted intelligence, and in a lot of cases, personal integrity, law firms are, are, are considered to be just this side of a, a terrible disease, right? Well, what if you're a lawyer who's got nothing but integrity and then this is going down your street? Yeah. Is this you? Does this represent what you do, who you are, and how you do it? It certainly does the law firm that works on this type of questionable marketing material. But is it you? Mm, I hope not. But the thing is, if you're not a brand, it is you. Because you're, if you're not a brand, you're as bad as the worst apple in the barrel you choose to inhabit thing about being a brand is getting out of the commodity apple barrel and becoming a honey crisp apple which is a branded apple that is then something that people actively seek out and don't compare to the rotten apples in the barrel i want to give you a, again using lawyers i want to give you a great example of both personal and professional nonfiction branding in action Williams Family Law. 
a dedicated adoption law firm. One word, adopt. Complete your family through adoption from uh, law I am experienced and dedicated to you. This is not the previous law firm. This is a person who's got a smiling face, who seems warm and is laser focused on something that hits right here that will then enable your brain to say, you know what? I wanna work with you guys. Let's go further. Let's meet Liz Williams McCallum. And we don't just meet her, we meet her family. So she understands the value and importance of family. And then she talks about it very personally in that little bit of copy. Adoption creates a legal relationship and ends the legal relationship between the child and their biological parents. Because of this, adoption is a major legal, financial, social, and emotional step for everyone. Williams Family Practice Law is a law firm dedicated to adoption, and I look forward to joining you on your adoption journey. And this is the photography they choose to feature on their website. Nothing but people. And again, this is all stock photography, right? We all know this came from iStock. We all know it, some of it came free through things like Pexels or Pixabay, but it doesn't matter because all the photos are about adoption in one form or another. And the takeaway from this is they understand. And a lawyer who understands, what's the value of that lawyer to you if you want to adopt? I hate to use some um, MasterCard's campaign, but to me, that's priceless. With a website like that, you've met her long before you meet her. I mean, Liz McCallum, I already feel like I know who you are, what you do and how you do it because your marketing has been so clear and you didn't tell me about all the other law stuff. You didn't tell me, and I'm sure there's other stuff you can help us out with. But if, if I use you for an adoption thing, who am I going to be, be going to when it, I need some estate planning or I, I need to talk to a lawyer about creating a will and things like that? She is the gateway to a referral network. And I would be if I were a lawyer, incredibly enthused to be part of her network because she's bringing people in the right way to build relationship that, so that I can serve them in the way they've become accustomed because they worked with her. Her value and her brand elevates her out of that barrel of rotten apples commodity lawyer into something that is a premium position in the marketplace. And that's what branding can do. And that's what social media can do. Because again, every time that Liz McCallum posts a photo of a happy, successful adoption on social media, what do you think Facebook does? It goes nuts. Everybody associated with anybody involved with that adoption then sees and pumps out and becomes an evangelist for their services. And it's done in a very heart first way. Social can activate the heart so fast. The question is, are you using social to activate the heart so that the head can later rationalize the purchasing decision? Now, here's the thing. One does not simply create a brand. One already is a brand. And of course, I'm, I'm using uh, the uh, Aragorn here from uh, Lord of the Rings. And then I'm gonna mix metaphors in the next slide because I wanna talk about how you can start creating a nonfiction brand today. You gotta remember your words. So it's nice that Sean Bean was both in Lord of the Rings and Game of Thrones, but he's really helping me make my point because your words are the foundation for who you are, what you do and how you do it. They are the key conceptual pillars that help you define exactly who you are. And that's why I like to have everybody I work with start with your key three. What are the key three concepts, words, and phrases that define who you are, what you do, and how you do it? Because all this stuff will determine what you should be doing on social media. Let's talk about this. The key three. My definition of the key three is the three foundational concepts 
that concisely and consistently define and communicate your brand. Cool? Consider the following example. United States of America, one of the biggest brands in the world. And in fact, USA is a brand. It's organized on a conceptual foundation architecture. It's founded upon sp very specific documents, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights. It's so important, a brand that has, it's got its own brand cops in the form of the Supreme Court of the United States of America. These are the people who ideally call the balls and strikes. Are we on brand? Are we off brand? They are the marketing department of the United States of America at the very highest level. They get to say what, what is true and what isn't true about the United States of America based on our founding documents. But here's the thing. They can't do anything without a co code. You can't cop without a code. And an effective brand is the uh, uh, code foundation for everything, especially your activity on social media. Do you think this is just a flag? No, it's not just a flag. It's a marketing communication that tells you a lot about a brand. Take a look at this Betsy Ross flag and let me dissect it a second from a conceptual point of view. How many stars are there? 13. How many stripes are there? 13. Why is that? 13 original colonies came together. They united in a circle to create a union. A sum of the parts is greater than the whole, or the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And take a look in there. Remember, Virginia and New York were incredibly big colonies. Pennsylvania, big colony. Rhode Island, tiny colony. Is there a tiny star and five big ones and a couple of, are they various sized based on population? No. Each one of those colonies is represented here as an equal member of the whole. Same thing with the stripes. They aren't dip different widths. They are the same width because, again, they are communicating each one of our states, each one of our constituent parts is an integral part of the whole, which is, again, greater than the sum of the parts. See what a brand, can, a, a, a graphic brand communication can do conceptually? Does everyone get this every time they see it? No. Does the heart feel it every time they see that flag? For a great many people, the answer is yes. So here we are, the key three. What is the key three of the United States from my point of view? Well, I go back to a copywriter that I really like, uh, Thomas Jefferson, and it's life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That it right there. Those are the three conceptual foundation part, parts of the United States of America. When we are at our best, we represent life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness for everybody on the face of this planet. I'm not saying we're perfect. I'm saying we're perfectible in order to form a more perfect union from the preamble of the Constitution. What does that mean? We aren't perfect, but we're working to get there. And that makes this country truly exceptional. It's the first country on the face of the earth to be founded on an intellectual philosophical foundation. And look how powerful that philosophical uh, foundation actually is. Now, this goes all the way back to when I worked on Coca-Cola as a young copywriter in Atlanta, Georgia, I constantly had my posterior handed to me by marketing uh, directors who would ask me, how does this ad say authenticity, refreshment, and sociability? They literally judged every communication I did based on those three things. I could have the best ad in the world. It could be funny. It could be exciting. It could be inspirational. It could make you cry. If it didn't cover all three of those bases in a way that made sense to them, it was dead on arrival. Why? Because they were protecting the sweet brown bubbly water called Coca-Cola. And keep in mind, Coca-Cola 
is only the real thing, the original, because they beat Pepsi by a year in 19, what was it, 1996, I think? Or eight, I'm sorry, 1886. 1887 is when Pepsi came out. So they beat Pepsi by a year, and yet Coca-Cola today is beating uh, Pepsi by a country mile. Uh, again, they're not without their challenges now that we have an obesity crisis, but they are one of the globals, one of the globe's biggest brands for a reason, because they are always authentic, refreshing, and sociable. By the way, we're coming up to the holiday season. Is anybody thinking about or looking forward to the upcoming Coca-Cola ads that are going to feature polar bears and who knows who else? There's a reason why Coca-Cola goes so big on the holiday season. And that goes back to an illustration of a Santa Claus holding a Coca-Cola bottle uh, that was done by Harold Sunbloom in 1933. Why do we think of Santa Claus as having a red coat and white ermine trim? Could it go back to that 1933 illustration? Why do we think of uh, Santa Claus as a big, tall, uh, red clad holiday elf uh, is actually he's not an elf in our thinking he was in Clement Moore's original the night before Christmas if you go back and look at the original illustrations he was this short little guy when's the last time you saw saw a short little guy as Santa Claus you haven't because Coke successfully redefined Santa Claus with the colors of their brand yeah, that's the power of branding. Every brand needs a defined key three, including this dude. Yeah, and I use myself, for example, I, this photograph is actually a screenshot from one of the videos I'll, I'll post periodically on LinkedIn or my social feeds. And I, why is it in black and white? Well, there are some reasons for that. The gray looks really good. The, the grizzled, I'm leaning into the wisdom because I've reached my wise years. I've, I'm no longer trying to play down. I'm trying to play wise. I'm, I'm trying to be more Gandalf than, than Frodo uh, for a reason. Same thing with the glasses. These frames are Equinox EQ304s. I know this number because I've bought five <laughs> frames of these so that as my prescription changes, I can continue to have this same frame because it's part of the graphic packaging of my brand. Same thing with the black and white photography. By the way, one of the tips there, black and white is getting rid of, uh, wonderful for getting rid of Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer and uh, any uh, flaws in my skin are magically erased by black and white. So that, that's one of the reasons I do that. But that's not the only reason. My brand is based on a key three that consists of three concepts that are summed up by individual words. One, collaborative, creative, and provocative. And my company name, what's it called? Collaborator Creative. Oh, see what I did there? I took my brand foundation. My Two of my key three words are actually the name of my company. Why? Because who I am, I'm a collaborator. I work with people on the creative side of what they do. That means you're not gonna get spreadsheets or uh, anything like that from me because I will help you with the creative ideation, not necessarily the um, how many uh, impression points should we buy, blah, 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 all that stuff. That's not what I do. And you should know that. Instead, you should expect from me creativity. That's what I bring. And then finally, the last word, is provocative because that's what I truly strive to be. I try to be provocative in a smile on your face, but get you thinking way. I like to give you a tweak on the cheek, which is that's a really great idea. And then a poke in the eye, which means, have you thought about this? Because if you're not getting that kind of creative provocation from the people you work with, you're not getting your money's worth. If all they're doing is rubber stamping your idea, you may have great ideas but I've never seen a great idea that couldn't be made even greater by having a collaborator to work with. And that's me in a nutshell, summed up in three words, bingo, my key three. 
So I, I would love to invite you to do your own homework. And I've created a, a very simple, uh, and if, if you're interested, I can get anybody who's interested a copy of this five question worksheet, as well as a couple of other worksheets that I like to use. That's all about starting with you. What is the foundation of your nonfiction brand? And I, this works for both individuals who are seeking to build their personal brand and also companies that may not feel like they've necessarily nailed down their key three to the point where they can say, yep, that's exactly who we are. And that's exactly how we roll. So if you would like to get this worksheet, all you have to do is uh, email me at dp at dpknute.com and ask for them, say, hey, DP, send me the key three worksheet and I'll get that to you later today. Or you can text collab to 33777. If you do this, you'll be added to my emailing list. But since I never email anything, uh, you don't have to worry about it, right? And you can also unsubscribe anytime you'd like if I ever violate the trust of you giving me your email. But anyway, all you have to do, again, email me at dp at dpknewton.com or text collab to 33777. And I'll send you a number of worksheets that I think can help you get started. The other thing is I'm actively growing the speaking and presentation side of my business. If you've got a group or got a gig that might be interested in a talk about creativity, uh, branding, uh, the, the entire intersection between creativity, branding, and social media, and culture, we should talk. Finally, I've got two podcasts out there the Nonfiction Brand Podcast, and also Rotoma, the Rotoma podcast that I do with Spencer X. Smith. Uh, and Nonfiction Brand comes out every single Monday. So check out wherever you get your fine podcasts for free. And uh, I guarantee you, you're going to find some interesting people who are doing some incredibly interesting stuff, building their nonfiction brand, both for themselves and for their small businesses. And the book, Rotoma, the ROI of Social Media Top of Mind, of course, you can get it at Amazon and it, it is primable. So check that out as well. That's it for me. Uh, I, I really want to say thank you to Nari for having me do this. I'm looking forward to meeting you all in person on November 11th. Uh, of course, we're all going to be masked up and socially distanced but you will be able to uh, learn more about me, ask questions, et cetera. And I'll be giving a whole new presentation as well. So I really, really look forward to meeting you then. That's it for me. I'm gonna open this up to any questions you might have, if anybody has any questions and um, fire away. This is what I look like. This is my dungeon. As you can see, I enjoy guitars because that's part of my personal brand. And frankly, it's a whole lot more interesting than me just being in, in a basement someplace um, looking at drywall. <laughs> I mean, you guys should understand the, the value of a creatively eclectic space, right? Thank you, Tom. Great job on the presentation. I really appreciate that. Um, how often do you post on Facebook? You know what? I'm not a huge Facebooker myself, but some of the clients I work with are, you know, specifically, you know, you guys actually Facebook would be huge for you because it's an opportunity to show a ton of behind the scenes and before and after stuff. And that stuff is like candy on Facebook because, and Pinterest and Instagram. I mean, if I, if you were to say what channels would we be uh, really big at, if you are business to consumer oriented, those behind the scenes and before after stuff is like crack cocaine on Instagram, Pinterest, and Facebook. If you're doing more B2C stuff, LinkedIn, believe it or not, could be a really valuable place. But get, to get back to your question, how often do you post on Facebook? Connecting with someone on Facebook is a deal. We make a deal. I connect with you, you connect with me, shake. Now you don't post too much garbage and I don't post too much garbage and we can stay connected. But the second you violate that, that accord, I'm dropping you like a bad habit. So I believe that 
to do more than two Facebook posts a week violates that accord unless there's something valuable that you need to post that may be emergent. For example, um, you work with building materials, you work with consumers, you work with uh, commercial. Let's say a building material comes up with a, a situation like, remember a couple of years ago when there was all that Chinese formaldehyde flooring issue that 60 Minutes did a thing on? If you're a company that has ever installed any of that stuff, you better be communicating in a meaningful way uh, to your customers and your future customers. Not in a way that is uh, overly uh, dramatic about it, but if something's on 60 Minutes about a building product that you may have used or may have not used, go ahead and share that information. But otherwise, two times a week, maybe only once a week, five times a week, sorry, I'm dropping you like a bad habit because you're, you're clogging my feed. Your mileage may vary and your audience may be different, but Twitter has a tempo that is so fast, posting every single day is fine because by the time I see your thing, I haven't seen it the other five times you've done it in a week, right? Because it's churning so much. Facebook, uh, its tempo is not quite as fast. And here's the other thing. It's like a Moroccan bazaar with shiny objects everywhere. You're competing in the most polluted marketing environment in history on Facebook, which is why Instagram is fantastic. When you go to Instagram, you may be amongst other people in the feed or in their stories, but when they come to your store, they're only on you. Is this making sense? Whenever you, and I guess the, to underline it, I'd say that every time that you make a connection with someone, you are making a a contract, which is we're going to give you quality stuff and we're not going to abuse that connection. The second you do it too much, that connection goes away. Should you link Facebook and Insta? If it's all you can do, you know, if you only have two minutes in a day to do it, it's better than nothing. But if you have the time to do a Insta style feed to Instagram and a Facebook style feed, and it can be the same image or same stuff, but there are subtle differences in the culture of both of those channels. I know a lot of people who have foregone Facebook altogether and gone hundred percent Instagram in that combo. You know, if you're saying, should I do Insta? Should I do Facebook? Should I do both? Some people are clearly saying I only do Instagram because they don't like the Moroccan market aspect of Facebook. It depends on what your specific thing is. I am a big believer in if you only have time to do a little bit, maximizing by linking Instagram to Facebook is not a bad thing because guess what? Facebook loves promoting its own stuff and Facebook owns Instagram. If you want to play the algorithm, Instagram linking to Facebook is not a bad idea. Any other questions? Well, I again, it... If you have any questions, you've got my email address. I'm just going to throw that back on screen for a sec. Uh, my email address is dp at dpknewton.com. Let me go up to the one that actually shows it. There you go. And you can send me questions anytime you'd like. You can link to me at LinkedIn simply by looking for at dpknewton. There's only one, and that'd be me. And you know exactly what I look like now. Why? because I've demonstrated my brand in a meaningful visual way. Oh, this is a form of social media that we've done today. And frankly, it's the most effective form of social media I'll be doing this week. Because hopefully, every single one of you will ask to connect to me on LinkedIn. And you know, maybe we never talk again, but we'll be linked. 
And that's the first step toward a relationship. Well, Gina, thank you so much. I really enjoyed this webinar. Um, and then Michelle is saying, thank you. Thank you all to everybody here. I guess this is it for me and I can't wait to see you next week by all or on the 11th. If you're there, by all means, come up six feet away and say hello, because I would love to get a, a face to a mask to a name to a face, right? Again, I want to thank Michelle and everybody at NARI for inviting me to do this. And I can't wait for the 11th. Hope to see you there. I think that's it. Oh, um, thank you. And the uh, at the Remodeler Supplier uh, Expo, is that what you're saying, Michelle? Cool. All right, I'm gonna end this. And you've got the video or I'm gonna end the recording right now. Hold on. Gotta get my pointer on the right app.